All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Hello, Wendy. There we go. So hopefully you're all here to learn about managed availability. If you're not, the doors are back there. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about today uh, two key areas I want to kind of focus on. Number one is why did we change our monitoring story in Exchange 2013 and what the architectural changes that we introduced into the product, how they drove us to a new monitoring story. And then we're going to delve into what those monitoring related improvements are. The end result, well, hopefully, as you walk away from this, we'll realize that our monitoring capabilities in Exchange 2013 provide a, a great deal of recovery-oriented computing, which will hopefully reduce the operational costs in the, in the environment, as the system will hopefully recover itself, as opposed to forcing you guys as the administrators from having to do a majority of that work. So what, where did we come from? I think a good portion of where we came from is looking at what we've done in the service in Exchange Online. We started several years ago uh, with Exchange Labs as a grassroots implementation, which kind of evolved over time into a live at EDU offering, hosting millions of mailboxes for our, our education-related customers, and has grown to several tens of millions of mailboxes in Office 365 with SharePoint Online and Link Online. As part of that has to do with the way we monitored monitored that environment and how we took action when we found an issue. Originally, we deployed with a single SCOM management group. And over time, as the service grew, that SCOM management group became a scalability concern. We were, we were hitting over 2 billion reads per second within that single correlation engine, which, as you can imagine, means we're waiting for alerts to fire as a result. So we had to grow and evolve our management groups over time. We had uh, today, with what remains of our Exchange 2010 portion of Exchange Online, we have close to 45 management groups within SCOM. So a significant amount of overhead into our SCOM area for just alert and notification uh, aspects of the service. And not only did we use SCOM, we used SCOM primarily for alert and notifications. We didn't use it for recovery actions. We actually built into the service our own recovery workflow that was separate from the Exchange product base, uh, but was something that we used to drive automations and recovery. Oh, brother. We'll fix that in a second. Um, from there, we... We looked at where Exchange 2013 is moving. Exchange 2013's architecture is, in some regards, has significantly changed from the past two releases. We moved away from having uh, protocols execute on the client access server role to having the, uh, uh, the user's request serviced by the protocol instance that is local to the active database copy. And that's driven a whole bunch of other architectural changes into the, into the product, namely that we get away from a lot of the version dependencies that we had in the past two releases that kind of constrained how we did upgrades and managed the environment. The result of that architectural change mean that we had to change the way we looked at monitoring, and like high availability, for instance. In the past two releases, high availability was mostly focused on the store and database health. Whereas in Exchange 2013, we have to look beyond that because of the fact that the protocol that's actually driving the user's behavior is actually local to that active copy. We don't want to activate a database copy that is, uh, that is on a server in which the RPC client access service isn't running or the World Wide Web service because that means that we're not going to have client connectivity. No one's going to be able to connect to that box. So that's, a, that's not a desired behavior. So, our high availability framework has to take the protocol health into account, and that's one of the areas that we've addressed, like best copy selection, as Scott will talk about tomorrow in his high availability talk. We'll delve into protocol health. Um, I keep getting distracted by my machine that's making beeps at me. Um, <laughs> demos. That's why I don't like demos. Um, so we had to evolve our, our high availability story as a result of that, and that takes into account monitoring. As part of that, we looked at the overall picture. You know, with the, one of the key differences for you guys in terms of if you've deployed Exchange 2010, how many have deployed Exchange 2010? Wow. 
Wow, significant number of you. How many are on 2007? Not as many. All right. I see we did something right with 2010 then. So one of the things that is vastly different between these two releases is our code base in terms of how we manage the code base. In Exchange 2010, we actually had two different code, code paths, code branches. We had a branch for the service, and we had a branch for on-premises, which meant that any changes we made to solve a monitoring-related problem in the service did not, didn't usually accrue to the on-premises build. And likewise, we actually had to have a customer-driven escalation or a developer or a tester or a program manager sit there and say, hmm, this code change we're making in the service, that equally applies to the on-premises world. So we should merge that into the on-premises branch. Whereas in Exchange 2013, single code branch. So when we talked about like our, our cumulative update strategy, one of the things that we talked about is the fact that we are ensuring that we have a unified code base. That's where that's coming from. Any change we now make to the service will get rolled and deployed to the on-premises world via one of the cumulative updates or a service pack in the future. So that way, any monitoring, any changes we make, whether it's the monitoring infrastructure, high availability infrastructure, anything, will ultimately accrue to you guys in the on-premises world. So service management. Our managed availability story. Ma the way we talk about monitoring now is, man is the name of managed availability. And that's really broken down into three key benefits or values that we feel that we can bring with uh, Exchange 2013. The first one is around being cloud trained. This is a concept where it kind of ties into what I previously talked about, the single code branch that we now have for the product. Any, all the learnings that we get by operating this service will ultimately accrues to the on-premises world as well through, through the integration of all the code and deployment of future cumulative updates and service packs. We're also changing the way we look at monitoring with Exchange 2013. Prior releases had this great attempt to drive toward root cause. Sometimes we did that really well, but oftentimes we were really bad at it. Um, part of that has to do with the way we looked at monitoring and we developed the health models in the past releases, but we're now more focused on the user and the user's experience with Exchange 2013. And as a result of that, when we look at and talk about recovery-oriented computing, which is our next uh, value proposition that we bring with managed availability, it's about protecting that experience of the user by solving the issues as they occur in real time so that we can ensure that we have a healthy end-user uh, solution. So from cloud trained. As I talked about, we've been running Exchange Online for over close to six years now, almost seven years. Uh, and it's morphed over time to grow to support tens of millions of mailboxes and, and more. We've learned quite a lot as a result of that. You know, there are many different ways in which you can operate and manage an environment. With Exchange Online and with like SharePoint Online and Link Online, we operate in what's referred to as a developer operations model. This is where we actually have the developer be the on-call for his, his or her component or feature. And so when there's an escalation that occurs, and that escalation could be driven through internal processes, like SCOM, firing an alert, or it could be something that occurs through the support channel, via an actual customer-driven issue. When the on-call developer receives that escalation, he's incensed to actually try and resolve that. Why? Because we're trying to build accountability into the development team for the product itself. And a developer who gets paged at two in, the, 2 in the morning is going to want to solve that issue so that the next time he's on the on-call rotation, he doesn't get woken up again at 2 a.m. for the same exact issue. The way we kind of go about solving these issues is many different paths. We could develop a code fix and solve the problem and deploy that into the service. Or we could develop a recovery workflow. Like, for example, the OAuth service stops responding to users' requests. What's one way we could solve that? By restarting the app pool for OWA. That might solve the problem. And that's a quick recovery mechanism we could implement. So that's kind of the things that we look and, and receive by putting the learnings back into the product, these recovery workflows. We've also learned a great deal in terms of what it takes and what it means to manage a service. The first, the first kind of, I have four key tenets. The first tenet 
that I have with respect to build, managing a service, whether it's a, an on-premises deployment or a service that's hosting millions of mailboxes, is that failure always happens. Failure is a constant. It is a fact. Now, many people try and go about building redundancy to solve failure. But redundancy simply is complexity, and complexity breeds failure. You're kind of in a loop there. So how do we address it? Well, the way we kind of want to address it is we want to get to predictive failure modes. You know, whether a NIC fails, a power supply fails, a motherboard fails, the recovery action should be the same. The recovery action should be that the software activates another database copy. We shouldn't worry about, oh, we have NIC teaming in place, or we have redundant power supplies, or anything. Build a, build a simplified recovery solution so that you know exactly, no matter what happens, you have the same recovery model for, for solving failures. That's how you address failures. The other thing that we, we've looked at is that um, change is a constant within the service. It's always adapting. It's always growing. We're always adding more capacity. We're always increasing more users. So we have to adapt to that. We cannot be stagnant and get beh stuck behind processes and procedures that keep us from being able to innovate and grow as time goes on. We also have to deal with the fact that uh, you know, there's an increased level of scrutiny around security practices and managing those practices within the environment. And the last one around, and this one kind of ties back to my first tenet around failures, is you also need to build automation to reduce the, those failure modes. So instead of building each server by hand, you deploy, you develop a script that deploys the software and the firmware and everything. Every single customer escalation that I get brought on on, we always ask for a copy of the, you know, the layout of the DAGs. We ask for the server configurations of each member in that DAG. We ask for things like the NIC drivers, the NIC firmware, the HBA settings, and so forth. And guaranteed every single time, there's at least two members of that DAG, if not more, that is seriously out of date. And that's generally the servers that are not behaving properly. And it's usually the NIC. Always keep your NIC drivers up to date, your firmware up to date. Best learning I can give you on that one. So we're user focused. I think the best way to describe how, what I mean by user focus is through an example. I think all of you have probably used an ATM machine at one time or another, right? Yeah. Yes. So the way to look at this is, I need to get to the ATM machine. My first point is, can I get inside the building where the ATM machine is located? Is that door open? Is it accessible? Is the, if it's a convenience door, is it open? Things like that. That's my measure of availability. Can I get to it? The next thing is, is there a line that I have to wait in to actually access the ATM machine? The number of people within that line is directly proportional to how long I have to wait. And of course, if you're like me, you get impatient because there's always that one or two people in the line that seems to have never used an ATM machine before in their life <laughs> and takes 10 minutes. So that's a measure of my latency. And then the last one is around, you know, once I get to the ATM machine, I insert my card, I enter my PIN, do I get my money? Or do I have a problem, right? Recently, I had an issue where I actually went to the ATM, I was able to enter my PIN, I was able to see my balance, and then I selected, you know, withdraw $40 or whatever, and it told me to contact customer service. Okay, so I let the guy behind me go after a few tries and trying different accounts and everything, and he was able to get money out. So I knew it wasn't the ATM machine out of money, and it turned out to be the bank unchecked the ability for my debit card to actually withdraw money from the ATM or some crazy thing. But that was my error, right? And it was a, a non-intuitive error, just call customer service. But that's a measure of my error. That's what we're doing in terms of being user focused and measuring the end-to-end -end user experience along those three key dimensions where possible and determining whether we have a, su a success, really. Is, are we able to facilitate that user request? Is that user request fast? Does that user receive any problems? So here's where I got to try and get our VPN back running. Anyone who's ever attended my sessions, you know I generally do not do demos, and it's for this reason.
Impressive demo, huh? We'll go with the server since it's back up. So the first thing, I, I want to do a demo on this whole concept of recovery-oriented computing and show you what I mean there. So the first thing is, let's look at our copy status. So you can see on this particular server, which is H1472, I have three database copies, MDB1, MDB2, and MDB3, and one of those is mounted, MDB2. That's all I want to show. There's three servers in the DAG. Each has a copy of a database. So you can see that I have that deployed. Each server is currently hosting a, a database copy as the active copy. Next thing I want to do is I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I want to show that our, that our high availability story is actually operating healthy. That's what that alert value of healthy is for our data protection health set. And we'll talk about what a health set is in a little bit. But it's essentially a grouping of uh, measurements for determining whether this server is, uh, this particular set of components is healthy. Within that data protection set, I'll have something like uh, eight counters for measuring the availability of things like the replication service, the information store, and then I will have around nine count, nine nine things measuring for each database on that particular server. So we can see we're healthy. So let's do something simple as stopping the replication service. All right. So if we run the get mailbox database copy commandlet again, we'll see that the databases are now marked as service down. And that's because the replication service is no longer functioning, so we can no longer get any uh, information with respect to the health of those particular databases. Now, our health set currently says healthy. And that's only because you see on the, on the right, the last transition time is the last time the, the, uh, the uh, particular probe executed to measure the health of this particular health set. In this case, it was 1152, which is in about a minute. We should, or well, that was a while ago, but within about, a, within about 60 seconds, we'll see this counter change to a value of unhealthy. And this is a, the fun part about the demo, because you have to wait. It's like waiting for paint to dry sometimes. It will eventually kick off. Maybe you shut down more services. No, I don't want to shut down more services. <laughs> I want a consistent demo. <laughs> Yes. There it goes. So you can see it's unhealthy, right? So now we know it's unhealthy. So that will kick off our recovery-oriented process, which should start back a service. Or in this case, it didn't. So this was demo two. Demo two has already begun. Um, throttling. Throttling gone wild. So throttling actually stopped us from restarting the service, unfortunately, on this particular server. Let's see if it would do it on this server. 
there's a reason why I had particular servers chosen. So we're healthy here. So what we'll see as a result of this other server, I'll just skip the demo too. What we will see is that we're going to attempt to start that service. We're actually going to do it four more time, three, one more time. We've attempted it three times already to start that service. And you can see it's pretty much on a 45 second timer that we attempt to do this. So after the fourth time, we'll kick off a next recovery action, which will actually be to move the databases because we can't get the service restarted. Now, the reason why we can't get the re service restarted is due to throttling, which I will explain later, after, which was when that demo was supposed to execute. Again, why I do not like demos. All right, so our fourth time. The other server. How the other servers do it? Oh, and it throttled it too. Ay, ay, ay. So MDB2 was originally mounted here. And we will now see that MDB2 has been mounted on this guy as a result of the fact that we took, we took it out. So it actually already initiated the failover. And we can see that it, MDB2 is now mounted on 3938. And because we're throttling on 6079, eventually MDB1 will be mounted on 3938 as well as a result of this. So back to the slide slides. So what originally I was going to show you was that the service was going, the service was to say, the service failed by me stopping it. Managed availability was going to come in and restart the service, and the system would become healthy again. Instead, what we saw was the service restart was throttled because we had actually achieved too many restarts within the allotted time, and it kicked off a second recovery action, which was to move the databases. But the point is that, that the goal is essentially this tagline, which we came up with in the managed availability team, which is stuff breaks, but the experience does not. Because in the end, there was still no human involvement there within that entire demo. The database failed over on its own because managed availability kicked off a, a, a failover a action against the environment. If we, we can look at it in, in terms of this way. I, so I have a user. He's going to hit his load balancer for his namespace. He's going to get assigned to a CAS. CAS is going to authenticate that request. CAS is going to do a service discovery to look up where the user's mailbox resides within um, which database. Query Active Manager within the DAG to determine which DAG member is hosting the active copy of that database, determines that is mailbox one, and proxy the request to mailbox one. User is then going to be able to send a mail like he wanted to. After he sends the mail, we have a failure of that OA instance on mailbox one. We will detect that failure. We'll initiate a fast recovery. Like I said, in, in, it could be something as simple as resetting the application pool associated with the OA virtual directory. OA is then verified as healthy again. And from an end user perspective, he doesn't notice a thing. The next time he goes to send another message, He's able to send another message without issue. He has no disruption in service. Now, let's say OA fails again after that point. We attempt that fast recovery, but for whatever reason, the reset doesn't work. OA has still failed. We will then initiate a different type of recovery action, a more aggressive recovery action. In this case, we fail over the database to another server. Because once we fail over the database, that connectivity is now going to shift to the server hosting the active copy. So we will no longer be using mailbox one. 
OA instance to service this given user's request now that his database is active on Mailbox 2. At some later point, OA can be become healthy again on Mailbox 1. Once it becomes healthy again, it then becomes a good target for failover at a later date in the event that we need to fail over. That's kind of a high-level view of what we're doing with recovery-oriented computing. Does that make sense? All right. Well, we've already done that demo. So, managed availability. You can think of managed availability as it's a process that runs on the Exchange server. It's under the Exchange Health Service uh, process. And it has three main components. These components run asynchronously, and they're constantly doing work. We have the probe engine. The probe engine is doing nothing more than gathering data. That data is then fed into the monitor engine. That monitor engine, you can think of it as a pattern recognition engine. It's simply analyzing the data that is, found, that is obtained from the probes and then taking action on that data. That feeds into our recover engine, which is what we re refer to as responders. These uh, responders are what does the work to recover the system in the event that it is unhealthy. And then lastly, there is this notion of escalation. This is when the system says, hey, we've done everything we could, but we can't solve the issue. We need to get a human involved. This is where SCOM comes into play. SCOM is our notification engine. We have to, when we escalate, we're reporting an alert that is picked up by SCOM so that SCOM can engage you guys to tell you that there's a problem. Yes? What if you don't have SCOM? What if you don't have SCOM? Well, then we won't be able to use the escalate to update SCOM. Instead, you'll have to, you'll have to use the commandlets within the product that I'll talk about later, the one I showed, get health report, to see that there's a problem and to work on that. And I guess this is probably a good point to talk about the management pack. Um, you know, in, in previous releases, the management pack was an interesting animal. <laughs> you know, uh, and this again ties back to our, 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 our work in Exchange Online. You know, the management pack for Exchange 2010 has probably close to 1,100 rules today. In Exchange Online, we only have about 150 of those rules actually enabled. We disabled the rest. We found they were way too noisy, which I'm sure many of you can attest that they were too noisy, right? And part of that goes to how we developed health models. You know, when we would sit down with a component team and say, hey, we need to develop a health model for your feature, they'd say, okay, great. And they'd go and start listing out each particular component, like transport, for example. You have SMTP in, you have SMTP out, you have store driver, you have categorizer, you have routing agents, you have transport agents, and the like. And they'd go and develop alerts for each one of those little components. But that doesn't really tell you the whole story. Like, when you get an alert that says store driver isn't functioning, what does that tell you about the end user experience? It doesn't really tell you much. It just tells you store driver's not functioning. Now, those that are in the know on particular transport knows that that means MIME to MAPI conversion's not working correctly. But it doesn't, doesn't mean transport's not functioning. You could still be receiving messages. They're just queuing up in the, in the transport queue because they can't be delivered to the store, right? So you don't know that end-to-end -end picture. Is transport working or not? And that was one of the problems we saw with the management pack. And so we're, moving, we're evolving that into this managed availability concept. You know, I, if any of you listened or read any of the articles I wrote about our architecture in 2013, one of those guiding principles I talked about is every server is an island. And that ties back in with this approach in managed availability. The, the server is the island. The server in of itself is responsible for monitoring itself and evaluating itself and asking for help in the event that it cannot solve the problems. This takes away that, that concern around scalability that we had with SCOM in the past in the Exchange Online business, at least. Because now, each and every server is doing its own pattern recognition to determine if there's a problem or not, and is able to update accordingly. And the, way, and the other thing that we needed to look at is in terms of correlation. You know, one of the problems that we had with correlation is around dependencies. You know, you get an alert around OWA today in Exchange 2010 or Exchange 2007. But you really don't know if that outage around OWA 
is specifically due to a problem with the OWA processes or if it's due to a database dismount. You have to do a lot of work to figure out what actually is the problem. And we wanted to ensure that we didn't have the same problem managed availability. So we needed to break the system down and remove those dependency barriers. So the way we did that is through two key areas, system level checks and end user experience level checks. So we call these self-tests. The first one is what we refer to as a one probe, which is a mailbox self-test. This is doing a deep protocol execution through the entire stack on the mailbox server role, from the, through the process down into the store. That in of itself is very similar to what we had in previous releases. We don't know, for instance, in this case, if this gives us an alert. We don't know if it's the protocol that's ha having the problem or if it's the store having the problem. We just simply know there's a problem that we need to address. This is where our second probe comes into play, a protocol self-test. This is a very skinny test. We're simply doing, we're simply asking, can the protocol process a request? We've removed, we stripped out all the dependencies. We're not talking to Active Directory. We're not talking to store or anything like that. It simply can the protocol process the request. And that actually runs on a detection of every 20 seconds. So we know within 20 seconds if there's a problem with the protocol, whereas the mailbox self-test executes around every five minutes. So we know the combination of these two, the probe one and the probe two, tells us a great deal of information. If we have a working two probe but a failing one probe, what does that tell us about OWA? Anyone know? It tells us tells us we don't need to focus on OWA because of the fact that the, the protocol self-test is passing. We know we can drive our investment down into the store layer. We could delay firing any alerts about OWA in that case because we know it's something deeper that we need to troubleshoot and solve. Whereas if we have a failing two probe and a failing one probe, we know we should focus some of our investment into, into looking at the protocol itself. As you can imagine, if we're going to do a protocol self-test, it only makes sense to do a protocol proxy self-test at the client access server role layer. And again, this is something very lightweight that simply, does, simply determines whether the protocol proxy can process a request. It's not dependent on Active Directory. It's not dependent on actually connecting to the mailbox server. Can we simply process a request? Yes or no? It's binary, essentially. And then we have the end-to-end -end user experience, what we call a customer touch point. This executes from CAS and talks directly to a database, through the, runs the whole gamut of the protocol stacks, through the proxy, through the protocol, down to the store. This, runs, this executes every uh, 20 minutes. This is our safety net, if you will. If everything else fails, this will tell us that we have a problem that we need to solve. And this, runs, uh, this is executed on CAS in this example. So the probe engine. The probe engine is essentially broken down into three key components. You have the probes themselves. The probes are nothing more than executing synthetic transactions. They just want to evaluate the customer or user perception of the service. Can we actually log on to the store? Can we actually send a, a message through transport? Things of that nature. We then have our checks. Our checks are nothing more than taking measurements, gathering performance data. You know, what is the CPU utilization? What is the memory utilization? What is the network utilization? Things along those lines. And then we have the notify engine. The notify engine is just a means for us as a probe when we gather this data to say, ah, hey, we've already let, for example, RPC requests. We've hit the maximum number of RPC requests. We shouldn't need to wait because at that point, the server can't accept any more connections for RPC. So we shouldn't have to wait that 30, 40 seconds for the monitor to evaluate that new data point and become unhealthy. We know it's broken. So at that point, we should just be able to immediately trigger the monitor as unhealthy, which will then trigger a recovery action. Right? So that's what a notify does. It allows immediate execution of things when we know the system is un unresponsive. which leads us to monitors. Monitors take in all that data that's collected by the probe infrastructure and analyze it. And, and it makes a, a binary decision. We're either healthy or we're unhealthy. 
If we are unhealthy, the monitor is driving the sequence of recovery actions that are then performed on the system. Now, while I say our monitor is binary, healthy or unhealthy, there's actually several states you can see when you're looking at the system when executing commandlets like get health report. There's actually uh, several other states. The first one is a state of degraded. Degraded means is the state that occurs in the first 60 seconds, typically, of when a monitor is unhealthy. Once the 61st second hits, the state will be changed to unhealthy. It's just, a, it's just a different notification, essentially. We also have a state for, we have two operator-defined states. We have a state of repairing, which is a means by which an operator who is performing some sort of manual recovery task, like rebuilding the uh, OWA virtual directory on the web bot, on the, on, the, on the server, on the client access server or on the mailbox server, has the ability to specify that because otherwise, because the OWA virtual directory isn't there, all these health sets related to OWA are going to be reporting unhealthy. He has the ability to go in and define that he's currently fixing the problem and then it's repairing. Now, the state will only show as repairing for as long as there are no other issues. If another issue crops up, then the state would change to unhealthy. And we also have a state of disabled. Disabled is a mean, another means by which an operator can turn off a monitor because, say, for example, there's a problem in the environment and they don't want to monitor it or they don't need that particular monitor. Like if you don't deploy unified messaging, do you necessarily need the unified messaging monitors? No. So you could disable them in your environment. So that gives you the ability to disable them, to override that. And the last one is unavailable. Unavailable simply means that the Exchange Health Service, at the time that you executed the, the commandlet, was unable to retrieve any information about that particular monitor. It doesn't mean it's healthy. It doesn't mean it's unhealthy. It just means that it can't access any information related to that monitor. Responders. Responders take action based on the alerts driven by the monitors. Responders only execute when a monitor is unhealthy. They'll never execute in the event that a monitor is healthy. And as I mentioned previously, the monitors dictate the sequence of, of actions that occur when something is unhealthy. They, they define which responders will execute and when those responders will execute. Now, we have several built-in responders in the environment. We have, as I already talked about, a restart service responder as its name implies, will restart the service. We have a reset application pool responder, which will reset a virtual directory's application pool. We also have a failover responder, which, as its name implies, will fail over databases. We have a bug check responder. For those of you that uh, are familiar with Exchange 2010, we introduced the capability for high availability to bug check a box when we weren't getting the right information back from the extensible storage engine. We've taken that a step above and created a responder to manage that bug checking capability for us. And that's really a, a, a last ditch effort to get all activity off that box because we know the box is not performing in a healthy manner. We also have an offline responder. The offline responder is used for cli the client access server role. And it's a means by which we can take a protocol or a server out of the load balance rotation. The way we do that is we do health check pings. The load balancers, you can configure them to do health check pings. We have some consistent means by which load, balancing, load balancers can do these health check things in Exchange 2013. And based on the response that managed availability tells the load balancer, we can take either the protocol or the server out of rotation. I say or because it really is going to depend on your load balancer configuration and your namespace configuration, something that Greg will discuss in his talk, client access server talk, later this afternoon. As you can imagine, if we have an offline responder that takes serv servers or protocols out of the load balancing pool, we need the reverse. So we have an online responder, which can add the protocol or service server back into the rotation when the corresponding protocol or server becomes healthy again. And then we have an escalate responder, which, as I said, drives SCOM notification for there is a problem. And then on top of that, we also have specialized responders. Specialized responders allow each individual feature or component to develop something in the event that they need them that one of these built-in responders don't have. For example, how many of you are deploying large mailboxes? 
All right. So everyone here probably knows that for a large mailbox to be successful, you need a, you need a fast index, right? So that users can find their data. How many of you have had to deal with catalog corruption? Not that many. Well, that's good. Well, they're painful, right? Because you have to go and initiate a reseed. You have to first detect it in Exchange 2007 and Exchange 2010. And then you have to go manually do a reseed. Well, we don't think that's the best approach. We shouldn't drive an operator into having to perform a catalog reseed. So we actually have a specialized responder for that activity, a catalog reseed responder. The sole purpose in life is, with, based on the probes, checking the health of that catalog index. If the, if the catalog monitor goes unhealthy, we can initiate a reseed of that catalog automatically for you. So that we don't need to drive an administrator to do a reseed. So that we can ensure that we have a healthy database and its corresponding set of information for when that database gets activated. So let's put all this together. So I'm sampling data via the probe engine, gathering all that data. The monitors are analyzing that data and making a decision. Are we healthy or unhealthy? Right? We're healthy if we're green, for those colorblind. Right? And then we have a state, a name time state. Remember, the monitors drive the sequence of recovery actions, of which responders are executed and when they're executed. At some point, the monitor is going to go unhealthy, red, for those that are colorblind. Once a monitor becomes unhealthy, the current time is recorded, and we begin the name time sequence of events of trying to recover this service protocol, whatever it is, back into a healthy state to get that monitor green again. For example, we could have within that monitor definition a sequence of events. T1 is our first sequence of event. And we're stating in this, in this fictitious example that T1 will execute immediately because we're saying it executes at zero seconds. So immediately when this monitor goes unhealthy, we're going to execute T1. T1 could be as simple as if this is OA, restarting the app pool via the restart app pool responder. Now, we have a second name time sequence of events event, which is stating that in 10 seconds, if the monitor is still unhealthy, we'll execute the next responder. In this case, it could be one of these three, typically. Uh, if, and if we're talking about OA, and this is the mailbox server role, we're going to initiate a failover. Now, the important thing here is that this is all driven on time. So regardless of what the activity of that first name time sequence is, if the monitor is unhealthy at 10 seconds, we are going to execute the second responder. We don't care what the activity of that first responder was, if it was successful or not. It, it doesn't matter to us. What matters is that the monitor is still unhealthy 10 seconds in to the unhealthy event. Let's say we have a third name time interval. So 20 seconds after the second name time interval, we're going to check things again. And it's our third, inter our third name time sequence. Now on this one, I put that we'd escalate. So if after 30 seconds of our outage for OA, we detect that it is still unhealthy and this monitor has never changed back to a healthy state, we know something seriously screwed up on this box of which we can't recover. We restarted the app pool, didn't do it. Maybe, there, maybe we even tried a restart of the web service that didn't solve it. We try, and so we failed over the databases, and we're still unhealthy. At that point, we can do an escalation. If at any point during this sequence, the monitor became healthy again, this activity would cease. So a responder only executes while a monitor is unhealthy. As soon as the monitor becomes healthy, we stop execution of the name time sequence event. So if nine seconds in, the monitor reported as healthy, we would have not executed the second name time interval event. If at 29 seconds the monitor became healthy again, we would not have escalate, we would not have initiated the escalate responder. Yes? Yes. Great question. So the question is how locked down are these? How are they defined? 
So each component team or each feature crew that built a particular monitor defined their own name time sequence of events. So a monitor, like in this fictitious example, I showed that there were three name time sequence of events. A, a, the OA monitor may actually have four or five in particular. It's most likely, let's reset the app pool, restart the service, fail over, escalate, something of that nature. Each, each component defines them differently and defines the intervals in which they occur. You know, I use 0, 10, and 30. It could actually be 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and so forth. Like we saw with the restart service, there were actually, in, the, in that one, for detecting the replication service health, we actually executed, there were four, there were, there were five res responder activities that we saw. The first four were trying to restart the service, and it tried to restart it four times. And then after that, it triggered a database failover. And it was doing that every 45 seconds. So each monitor defines them. How you see them, is, or how you see them, Scott's actually, I think, going to cover some advanced scripting capabilities in his tips and tricks that shows it. But uh, how you can see it is actually within the Crimson Channel. So everyone knows about the Crimson Channel, right? This is a view you can see in the event logs. If you expand application services and logs, Microsoft Exchange, you'll see there are two that I have opened, active monitoring and managed availability. Active monitoring will show you all the definitions of things. So we can see here, let's, let's see if I can find one that actually is relevant to us for now. Probably not. It's called UM. PowerShell. Well, we'll look at this one. So you actually, if you look, you'll see the definitions of everything, which some of this information is, nah, I don't know anything. But this, this tells us, for example, our monitoring threshold, our monitoring interval. So we, inter we check every 2,400 seconds for this particular monitor. And you can see here is an example of our transitions. So we transitioned to unhealthy in zero seconds. We have other states like unhealthy one, 300 seconds, unrecoverable, which are used as part of the responder activities that show. So all of the, the definitions for everything are actually, you can see, within, within the Crimson Channel. So you can get all that information out that you want about what, mon what the probes are, what the probes are looking for. I'll get to that. So you can see all this information is, is there. And then you can see down in the managed availability section, you can see like we have recovery action logs, which tell us what what activity has occurred. So we can see that, you know, as the example that I showed before, the fact that the restart service, we attempted the restart service, but throttling rejected the connection because we had done too many attempts. So all this information is available, and there's even the results, which tell us that the recovery, you can see that here's the example of, of what we just did. Why is mine? Oh. Now I'm on this server now. So we can see here that this was the restart after we couldn't get, you can see the requester, the Service Health MS Exchange REPL endpoint failover. So that was. The requester, we were attempting to restart the replication service. We couldn't, so we initiated the next responder in, in the monitoring uh, rep responder pipeline, and it, which in this case happened to be this, the failover. So we initiate it, and you can see that, the result, that this result was successful. It tells you the actual time, the end time, uh, and so forth. So you get a vast amount of data from the Crimson Channel. And we actually have a blog article in the works that kind of walk through how to do all this through PowerShell. So you don't have to look at the Crimson Channel. And Scott's going to show several of those examples in his tips and tricks session. 
So any more questions about the pipeline? Yes? Yes. Yes. That's where that ties back to why the demo didn't work. Throttling will kick in. So there is, uh, it might be my next slide. We'll get the throttling. I think it's two slides in. But we'll, I'll answer that question in more detail. So any other questions about the pipeline? Yes? Yes, we'll get to that, too. You guys are getting ahead of me. So the result of this is that we've learned a lot by deploying this into the service and, and seeing how it's behaved. You know, For example, we've learned that the protocol self-test is an extremely good indicator of when a protocol is not functioning. That tells us pretty immediately that we have a problem at the protocol. If it can't do that simple, can I process the request? And over 90% of the time, resetting the app pool solves the issue for us and gets us back to a healthy state. You know, we've learned other things, too. We've learned that managed availability is noisy in some instances. And it, for example, we originally had the design for the mailbox self-test to check every single database on the server. Well, when there's a problem with the server, like the store process isn't functioning correctly, you know, if you have 50 databases on that box, you now got 50 alerts. We don't really need 50 alerts in that case. We only need one alert. So we, we tune that, and we actually change the architecture so that we're not hitting every single database, we're hitting one database on a box. Because that's still a really good indication that something's wrong if that one database isn't functioning. So things like that we've, we've tuned. And with each release, we keep iterating and improving managed availability. We've made some architectural changes in uh, cumulative update one, and we're making some other changes in cumulative update two. So all that's as a result of the work we've done in the service and managing the Exchange 2013 online service as we've migrated mailboxes to it. So back to your question. As you can imagine, having the system do a bunch of recovery activities has the potential to have a cascading effect which could overrun the system and bring the entire system down if it's not constrained in some fashion. This is where throttling comes into play. Throttling allows us to control it. And there, we do it across a vast number of different me means or methodologies. You know, we can take into account the minimum number of servers within a group. A group is a DAG or a group is a client access array or a load balance pool. We can look at the number of times we've actually executed that particular responder. Like with the restart responder, uh, in the build I'm using, the restart responder only allows you to restart the service once per day and has a defined maximum that you can restart it within the DAG. And apparently I've hit that, res that, I hit that limit even though I purposely didn't run this demo for two whole days. Something in my lab environment triggered it anyway. So we were throttled. We can also, you know, that looks into account time. And, well, I didn't talk about time. time. Time basically says, OK, like the restarting the service. I'll only allow the restart service to occur every 60 minutes. So if I have a problem where I reset the app pool, and then a few minutes later, or a half hour later, OA goes down again, I'm not going to allow a reset of the app pool. I'll, I'll, have, I'll throttle that because I already just did that. And obviously, it didn't solve the problem. So I'm going to, I'll throttle it, and eventually the next responder activity will kick off and, and fail over the databases in that particular set. And we can use combinations of the above. Now, depending on the responder, each responder can be coded differently. Uh, different behaviors can occur, whether we skip or we delay. Right? We can skip it all entirely. A great example of that is the bug check responder. In the event that when we look at when we're when we're going to initiate a bug check, we actually do an evaluation of the number of members within the group, 
We actually ensure that we have, um, uh, we are not below the threshold of the number of servers within the group. For example, it's usually a half. So we're saying like in a 16 member DAG that we have more than eight servers within that DAG in order for us to initiate a bug check. And we also look at the number of occurrences. And, and that number is typically two, though sometimes that does change. So we're saying essentially in, in this example I'm using, I'm saying that I require more than eight members of the DAG and I'll only bug check if the number of bug checks that I previously occurred within that day is less than two. If, any, if, the, if any, either of those fail, the, the, my litmus test, I don't bug check. I'd rather run in an unhealthy manner than bring down in, in the service, right? Because if I'm already at eight members, if I take any more servers down, I'm gonna bring down the entire DAG because I don't have a majority of, of the votes, right? So we don't wanna do that. So we'd rather Im impact a certain number of users than impact all the users in those cases. And that's where our CU2 comes into play. So cumulative update two uh, will ship uh, this summer. And we have made some targeted changes in terms of responder throttling in it. For example, uh, the restart service. In CU1, the restart service was, was throttled based on the number of occurrences on a per server basis. So uh, it may have been just one allowed per day, or it may have been two. I don't remember specifically. But basically we're saying, yeah, Scott's saying it was two. So we allow two restarts of the service per day per server. Whereas in Cumulative Update 2, we're saying we're expanding that to the group. And we're saying we're only allowing four restarts of that particular service, the re like the replication service. It's per service. Four within, within the DAG per day, and only one per day per server. So why I was getting throttled is because apparently in my three node DAG, I've already somehow triggered off uh, four restarts of the serv service, which happens when you're running pre-release code, because I'm running uh, the cumulative update to code that is not anywhere near final yet. So that's kind of the problem. So or not the problem. That's kind of the improvements we're making in terms of cumulative update two. Uh, we're expanding the per group notion across all the built-in uh, responders and even some of the specialized responders, like resume catalog. You know, for the resume catalog, we're saying we allow four resumes of that catalog per hour, but we're throttling it so that we will only do those four per hour if they're five minutes apart. And we only allow a maximum of, those, of that resume catalog execution to occur eight times per server, or 12 times per day in the DAG. Right? The bug check is on there somewhere. Watson, no. Oh, it's not on there. Oh, force reboot, yeah. So we're saying 600, 600 minutes per action that we're allowed. So when we restart a server, we're saying we want to execute another server restart force another server to restart within 600 minutes of the previous one. So that's how we're throttling to ensure we don't have that cascading effect that impacts the system. Does that make sense? All right, great. So management surfaces. We have this notion of a health group. Now, a health group is really only reported in SCOM. There's four health groups. There's three system level and one user level. The system ones are around service components. You know, we have, the first one's around service components. Things like OAB generation, real-time customer interactions, mailbox replication service, the transport service, the OWA service, things like that. And then we have server components, the physical disk resources, uh, memory, CPU, uh, network, things like that. And then we have our dependencies, Active Directory, DNS. And then we have our user group, the, the customer touch points. Is OWA healthy? Is ActiveSync healthy? Is Outlook healthy? And so forth. And these are only exposed in SCOM, these health groups. We also have health sets. So a health set is nothing more than a, than a collection of monitors, probes, and responders. And they determine whether that particular component, like OWA, is healthy or unhealthy. The, the, since we have many of these probes, monitors, and responders, in a single health set, we base the, the state of the health set, like that data protection example that I gave before in the demo, 
We base it on a worst of evaluation. If there is a single monitor reporting as unhealthy within that health set, the health set is going to be reported as unhealthy. If a single monitor is reported as repairing, the health set as a whole is going to be reported as repairing, and so forth. Now, we have a particular naming convention for all of our health sets. So you have the customer touchpoint health set, like for the OWA protocol, will be named OWA. For the uh, protocol proxy self-test, that is going to be named uh, protocol name.proxy or OWA.proxy. For our protocol self-test, that will be named uh, the protocol name.protocol. So hopefully that makes sense. But you'll be able to see that with all of them, the active sync, same with active sync, same with Outlook for the RPC HTTP connectivity tests and the like. I forgot to do the, the slide. So you can see exactly where those protocols map in terms of our monitoring layers, our probes. The command lines. We have two main command lines that I think you'll be using uh, on a regular basis. The first one is get server health. Get server health does nothing more than report the raw health of the data at the time you execute the command line. It's, there, it's a view of the state at the time you run it. And then there's get health report. Get health report takes that raw data and packages it up and gives you a nice report, like when I ran uh, the get health report commandlet for the data protection health set. You can also use get monitoring or mo the noun monitoring item identity. Monitoring item identity will tell you a lot of information. You can, uh, you can get information, like in this example, I wanted to show all the probes, monitors, and responders for the OA health set. So you can see here that we have the OA self-test, the deep test. The deep test is the mailbox self-test. And then the, somewhere there's a protocol one, probably. Or not on that server, there wasn't a protocol, because this was a mailbox server in particular that I executed that on. So you can see that you'll see there's a deep self-test for the particular database. There's self-test for the server itself. And then there are the responders, like OA self-test restart, OA self-test failover. Those are the names of two of the responders in this particular health set. So that's how you can get information. The monitoring item identity is also what you can use in terms of setting other particular settings about a particular monitor, probe, uh, or um, responder. And then the question on the right was around, how do I, how do I change some of the system variables that you've built in? I think all of you are probably familiar with, I mean, know the management set, and I'm sure all of you at one time or other have changed a rule in your management pack because our rule was either too noisy for your environment or didn't fire enough for your environment, right? So you might want to fine tune. So we do provide the means by which you can change the frequency of when a monitor would alert or become unhealthy. We generally don't want you to change the uh, certain specifics about the monitors, but the frequency of things, um, or the, the values, the thresholds. We really don't want you to modify the frequency. The thresholds and things like that are things that you would typically mo want to override. There are two scopes for overrides. You can override uh, a settings on a per server basis, or you can override settings on a global basis. Now, I've, I've received the question a number of times around, well, why aren't there more scopes? You know, why isn't there a scope for the DAG? Why isn't there a scope for a site, and so forth? Well, this is where the beauty of PowerShell comes in, because I can easily get the list of members within a DAG and pipe it to uh, the add server monitoring override commandlet and affect this, what I want. Same with CAS members. I can get all the CAS members within an Active Directory site and apply the server monitoring override. So the sky's the limit in terms of your scoping capability within the, with uh, your override framework. We just provide two simple scopes. In addition to our scoping on the server and global basis, we provide you a means by which you can define how, how long that particular override should apply. You can specify a version. So you can say, let's say, for example, the transport, one of the transport uh, monitors isn't functioning correctly due to a bug that we introduced in Cumulative Update 1. Well, you could apply a version for that. Uh, you could apply apply a global override, and specify the version is 620.29, and disable that particular monitor as a result. 
And then when you deploy cumulative update 2, which will have a higher version number than 620.29, the monitor override would no longer apply. So you can do things at a version level. You can also do it at a time-based level. So you can say, let's say you, you have a very large sales force, and you know that at the end of the quarter, the amount of email doubles within your environment. The, me the message flow doubles within your environment due to the sales people are acting all crazy. Well, you can specify a monitor override that says, OK, let's increase my threshold for my message queue for this period of time at the end of, at the end of this quarter coming up. So that way, I don't have to get alerted, because I know it's going to be double. And it's above the current threshold that the monitors apply. So it will only apply during that period of time. Uh, the key thing about overrides to remember is that they don't get acted upon immediately. So a server overrides written into the registry, and the health service has to check the registry to see when those are over updated. And then the global overrides are in Active Directory. And you're dependent on Active Directory replication for those. So you have to keep those, that in mind when you enact an override. It can take a, typically around 10 minutes for an override to take effect on a particular server. And we don't support wildcards. You can't just override in, in uh, an entire health set. You have to specify the exact health set and the uh, monitor, responder, or uh, probe that you want to uh, change specifically. These are the commandlets. It's server monitoring override and global monitoring override are the nouns. And then the verbs are get, add, and remove. Within the appendix, uh, I do list out what all the properties are and what the values are that you can configure for those. So that's in, in the, I think that's in TechNet as well now. Do we have any specific articles on overrides yet? OK, only command line. So we're getting there. The SCOM portal. As, I, as I've mentioned, the SCOM portal is only used to provide notification on the health of the environment at a point in time in which an escalation occurs. Now, it's important to realize when you're looking at SCOM that SCOM does not tell you the complete view of the server. It only tells you what was escalated to it. So while the OA health set may be saying that the protocol health is in question and has escalated to you because the restart of the app pool didn't work, the restart of the service didn't work, et cetera. It may not be telling you the fact that the transport service is also not healthy because the transport service hasn't hit the point, the monitor for the transport service hasn't, hasn't initiated the escalation responder for that. The only way to know the complete true health of the server at any given point in time is to run get health report. The monitor will, the SCOM will only tell you about what it's been told is wrong. The way it does this is through our escalate responder. When the escalate responder is initiated, it writes an event to the application log. That event is consumed by the SCOM management agent and is update, uploaded to the SCOM correlation engine. And that is what's reported in SCOM. That, that event indicates what's wrong, what what health set is uh, not functioning correctly, and that's what's bubbled up and reported in SCOM. And the dashboard is broken down into three key areas. You have uh, active alerts, organization health, and server alerts. So we can look at that here, assuming it all. Ay, ay, ay. Well, we'll come back and look at that, because it will take it took a, lot, a few minutes to bring up the last time. You can deploy the Exchange 2013 management pack on SCOM 2007 R2 or SCOM 2012. This is a, a, a screenshot of what you do see in terms of SCOM, the health reports, uh, the health groups. You can see here that I'm looking at a particular server in our dog food environment. Um, it's a client access server role, and I was looking at the customer touch points. And you can see here that the customer touch point is listed as critical or unhealthy. And if you view, do a deep dive into the state of that customer touch point, which is the second screen capture, you'll see that ActiveSync is unhealthy. So again, it's the worst of evaluation. All the other client protocols are healthy, but ActiveSync isn't. So we report the entire customer touch point as unhealthy for that particular one. And we need uh, 
admin involvement or operator involvement to try and resolve this in this particular instance. So the bottom line, coming back to the slide I previously showed with more detail, I have a user whose mailbox is on, DAG, on mailbox one. He, he submits a send. We have a failure with OA. Managed availability, the probes will detect that protocol self-test, will detect that we have a failure with OA. That will flip the monitor red. The first sequence in the recovery action is going to be to restart that application pool. That restart is com completes before the next name, inter name time sequence initiates, and O is healthy again. The monitor is now listed as healthy. I'll get to your question in a minute. We then, the user can still submit messages through OA and not have an issue. Then we have another failure. We detect that failure. We could attempt to restart the application pool. It's going to be throttled based on the information I gave you about CU2. The restart doesn't, doesn't happen as a result because of that throttling. We'll initiate the second responder in that name time sequence. In this case, we're going to fail over the database. Database 1 is now activated on mailbox 2. The service on mailbox 1 could restart at any time, maybe because we probably forced a server reboot at that point. And, but it doesn't matter because the user is now on mailbox 2, so we're accessing mailbox 2. At some later point, mailbox 1 becomes healthy again for that OA protocol. The protocol self-test is now passing. The monitor is now listed as healthy. And so it is now a good failover target again for database 1. So manage availability with our retry logic ensures that when stuff breaks, we can still have the experience. The user experience does not. So we're cloud trained by bringing the learnings from the service into the on-premises product. We're focused on the end-to-end -end user experience. And we're recovery-oriented by building in mechanisms to recover the system in the event of a failure. First question. So managed availability doesn't take in the health of the load balancer itself, because that's not an exchange product. I'm sorry? So we're not checking entirely through the namespace, we're checking through the server itself. Yes, we're checking through the server itself. Yes. On the last slide, you showed, well, not the last slide, you showed that the, right, the database Yes. Mailbox 1 becomes a candidate for failover again because the protocol is now listed as healthy. Because we want to take into account the entire health of that server. And we, want to, we only want to fail over to a healthy server in the, event, in the event that the rest of the protocols are healthy. Well, yes, but, well, there, there's really no, there's not necessarily a concept of preferred failure. There is an activation preference, but the activation preference is only used in certain circumstances. We actually, I mean, best copy selection is looking at a whole much larger wide range of things. Copy queue length, replay queue length, catalog health, and now protocol health. So we want to go back to the Well, we could in the event that, I mean, we're not going to move that database back. Uh, you have the script, the redistribute active database script. Now that will you will most likely have that configured to execute at any one time. Oh yeah, I forgot. We have, we have server architecture posters. You can come down to the booth and get them too. I'm, I'm bad at notifying them. Swarm Scott, knock them down. Yes. Yes.
Well, it, it will ultimately depend on how the responder is configured. If the responder is configured like, as an example, the bug check, where it will actually just skip, or if it will delay. And if it delays, it's going to delay to try to restart it. No, it's built in. Yes. That's not a configurable action, I don't think. So depending on the trigger that's deciding to skip, you may wait for it. Yep. Thanks. Very informative. Great. So the way it works today with Scott, you get notified when something happens. Yes. Not to SCOM. Not to SCOM. Because we solved it. No. That's the whole point. We want to reduce the operator costs. So, I may not have mentioned this. I forget. I talked about, I know I talked about root cause. I think. Oh. Damn. <laughs> I, miss, I miss that, that main tenant. Managed availability isn't driving toward root cause at all. We're not necessarily concerned about root cause. We want to get back to service health. That's the focus. We're about awareness when needed. But it's not about the root cause. Generally, the exception that occurs is good enough to determine what the root cause is. But we're not necessarily, we're not bubbling up root cause, because we never did it well to begin with. So we're not trying to now. We're simply saying, OK, O is unhealthy. How can we quickly get O healthy again? Yes. Everything's still recorded, right? You still have the protocol logs. You still have everything in the Crimson Channel, which tells you that it tells you the activities that managed availability took. So you can see all that. It, one of the one of the one of the responders, and I forget what we chose for on premises. Out of the box, Scott probably remembers. I think out of the box in on premises we do not do we do not collect dumps. That was one of the settings you have to set. Yeah, so you can actually configure it to actually take a process dump when it actually takes action. So that way, you can then try and drive toward root cause at a later point. OK. OK. Here's a bunch of, um, I have eight of them. First come, first serve, free for all. Um, a party on Wednesday. The mod. You'll need to take this. There's one, because that tells you where it is. There you go. There you go, Eric. Eric it's in. I've got two more. Who's going to fight me for them? All right. I'll give one to my friend Alex here. A party invite. We give, we give great liquor. Watch, watch, we won't have any great liquor, but it's at the Maison Bourbon. Wednesday. <laughs> 